And I'm Dr. Adam Jirachi. And you are listening to Love's a Secret Weapon podcast. Welcome back to our podcast. For our Valentine's Day episode, calling TV heartthrob Richard Chamberlain. That's right. Today we're going to talk about Donna's first big dramatic acting role on television hit drama series, Dr. Kildare, as well as the health crisis on set that created a lot of turmoil. How are you doing today, Donna? Happy Valentine's, darling. Happy Valentine's and to you. Thank you. And, and I send out lots of love to all of our listeners, and I'm so grateful that we're all gathering to um, take us back to, what year is this, 1965? This is 1965. Okay. And, you know, the 60s are alive and well. Lots of, you know, the ups and the downs, the darks and the lights of that era um, are really resurfacing for the whole world to now take those seedlings and just really like germinate them and let them blossom. And um, so, yes, we're doing we're <laughs> we're, we're we're doing a heartthrob episode with darling, darling Richard Chamberlain as our spotlight. What a good-looking and talented man. And so virtual roses to uh, our listeners. And Donna, I'd be very happy for you to start telling us about your seven-part guest role on TV's first big medical hit, Dr. Kildare. Yes, this is a continuation in Chapter 8, Shaken All Over. I was up for an audition to do an acting role in Dr. Kildare. Richard Chamberlain was the newest TV heartthrob, and this was a big deal. Maury had always set his sights on my acting ability, and I never thought of myself in that way. I was a singer. But that old vaudevillian approach to show business, sing, dance, act, was the way we operated. I did my best with whatever ability I had in both of my weaker talents. The night before my audition, I didn't sleep at all. The script I was going to read called for crying. I thought about this all night. And by the time I was ready to read for Mark Daniels, the director, my nerves were frayed. Mm, only a few days earlier, I had my wisdom teeth, all four, removed and was still feeling frail from that experience. The part I was reading for was a young mother who had kidney failure. Dialysis was the new medical marvel, a method by which those suffering from kidney disease would be able to live if they could be a candidate for the few machines available in those times. Anna, my part, was on the waiting list, and she had not yet qualified. The line was coming in the script where the direction in parenthesis said, and then she cries. I started crying really crying. I couldn't stop. The director and producer were stunned. Was I an actor? Well, I proved I could follow direction. Literally, I used up half a box of Kleenex while Mark Daniels and Douglas Benton decided to hire me on the spot. The full script was waiting for me at the offices of William Morris Agency, my agent, Norman Brokaw, congratulated me. My other agents, Barry Diller and David Geffen, were excited for me, too. And Marshall Burl, nephew of Milton Burl, my variety agent, told me, now you can add this to your resume. You're not just a singer anymore. I was still quite busy with Dr. Pepper, but I had time to spread my wings. Being a co-star on a hit TV series was a real score. My part was a seven-episode saga, a 10-day shoot starring Leslie Nielsen and Cloris Leachman. On one of those days that my shooting schedule was light, I invited my friend Janice to meet me for lunch on the MGM lot. 
She was a huge fan of the show. It was one of those rare times I got to be a teenager with my girlfriend and roamed around the stage, peeking into Richard Chamberlain's dressing room, lined with photographs taken of him doing ballet and a variety of roles. The next stage over was the set of The Man from Uncle, where she went gaga for David McCallum, the cute new blonde guy all the girls were crazy about. The day came for my big scene, the same one I read for. My call for makeup was 7 a.m. The makeup artist pulled my hair back and added shadows to my face to make me look sickly and poor. About an hour later, the scene was set and lit. Mark Daniels signaled for me to take my place. My dad grabbed his side and made an awful sound. He immediately fell to the ground. I ran to him saying aloud, he needs help. My dad wriggled on the concrete slab of the soundstage in terrible pain. I was crying all the while watching him until the studio ambulance arrived. He was lifted on a stretcher and put into the vehicle an old, dark green ambulance. I could see my dad's face through the rear windows. He managed to lift his head high enough to try and show me he would be okay. I was so frightened for his safety. Never before had I ever been left on a set alone without my dad. I called my mother and told her what happened. Then... Mr. Daniels asked to speak with her. He repeated the story and asked what hospital the ambulance should take Maury. Still crying, I said that I wanted to leave to be with my mother and father. Mark Daniels turned to me and said sharply, Time is money. Your father will be taken care of, and your mother will be with him. Now you get ready for your scene. I said, but I'm all cried out. I can't concentrate not knowing whether my dad is alive or dead. I felt completely abandoned and let down. I took my place in the scene, but God knows I was not all there. Take after take, and the tears wouldn't come. I was emotionally spent and traumatized by what had happened to my dad and the lack of empathy for me to be informed as to his welfare. I continued working on the scene all day and into the early evening, when finally, to get those tears flowing, makeup man had to directly spray my eyes with a solution. Finally, I received a message from my mother that Maury had needed surgery and was in recovery. His colon had exploded and the pain he had was internal bleeding. Several feet of his intestines were removed and a colostomy bag was installed outside of his body for elimination. How ironic. I'm on the set of Dr. Kildare acting out a part for a girl with a serious illness and my reality was that my dad almost died on the same set. I had to find a ride home. And Tom Nardini, the young man who portrayed the part of my husband, offered to drive me in this little Jaguar XKE that he had. As we exited the MGM lot onto Washington Boulevard, the skies were smoky. We drove east to see Baldwin Hills ablaze. It was August 1965, the scene of the Watts riots, and Baldwin Hills were ablaze. Tom dropped me off at my house on Grandview Boulevard where I entered a very dreary space. The absence of my mother left my brothers and me alone waiting her return. Soon after, our neighbor Camille stayed with us until my mother returned home at about 10 p.m. My brother and I were ushered into our rooms while the two women talked over the incident in a hush. All this drama and my stake in it was never discussed. Focus was on my dad recovering. He spent the next three weeks in the hospital. My mother was an emotional mess. There was no communication with her that would ease my mind about my dad. Her lack of communication with me was indicative of the secrecy that would eventually prove 
to be an unbearable wedge in our relationship. She chose an uncompassionate way of dealing with the situation and, as usual, kept me on a schedule and made me show up on time for work the next day. I had to rely on my faith that my dad and mom would be okay. For the next few days, ironically, I had a taste of freedom to explore and had two memorable experiences. <laughs> Just recently, I had the good fortune to see Cloris Leachman, who was part of the cast. I told her that I watched her go off into a dark place on the set and started to cry. I asked her if she remembered being on Dr. Kildare, to which she answered, she did. Then I thanked her for teaching me how to be a pro. I also hugged her and complimented her dancing on Dancing with the Stars. At 83 years of age, she could still kick up her heels. One of the funniest scenes in a sitcom I ever saw on television was on her series, Phyllis. The scene was when her daughter invited her boyfriend's parents to meet Phyllis. Her boyfriend's father, who was played by Billy Barty, a man of three feet nine inches in stature, Phyllis exits her kitchen holding hors d'oeuvres and unconsciously offers the first one to Mr. Barty and says, Shrimp? <laughs> of course, we all love her in Young Frankenstein. The other memorable experience was walking by a scene where Leslie Nielsen was lying in bed, supposedly dying of his kidney failure. He was extremely convincing and literally gave me the shivers. I had to take a moment. It was just too close to what actually happened to my dad. The brightest moment was the beautiful Richard Chamberlain almost waltzing down the hospital corridor in his crisp white jacket. Whatever drama played out on the set, all he had to do was smile and the mood was changed to one of a sense of hopefulness. His voice had an incredible resonance, especially when he and Raymond Massey exchanged dialogue. The timbre of the veteran actor's voice was the best bedside manner. I'll take a dose of Richard and Mr. Massey any day. The Watts riots turned into looting, and my awareness of my own chaos directly paralleled the turmoil in South Central. Issues of racial disharmony disturbed me internally. We are all one, I believe. I loved Martin Luther King's speech, Free at Last, and I had a dream permeated my every cell. I, too, am a freedom fighter and completely related to his cause. The violence had erupted on the street parallel the violence that erupted within my dad. The violent pain he experienced, the invasive procedure that, yes, saved his life, but became an indignity as his excrement accumulated outside of his body in a plastic bag. Almost to the day when my episodes began to air on NBC in October, was he scheduled to have another surgery that would eliminate the external waste bag and literally hook his plumbing up again to function normally. In retrospect, withholding the truth from me may have had a physical consequence with Maury eating away at the lining of his intestines. Living a lie definitely causes dire consequences. Wow, what an experience on that set of Dr. Kildare. And we often talk about, you know, comedy and tragedy as existing together. And Dr. Kildare wasn't a comedy, of course, but your experience on that set really reflects that idea that you can go from excitement and promise to despair very quickly. And, you know, you were due to film your big scene that had won you the role, your first dramatic role on TV, right before your dad collapses on set. That must have just been a, a horrendous experience. Well, it's almost like it happened yesterday when I mm. recall mm. it as any traumatic experience might be to yeah. someone when they give themselves the opportunity to reflect. And I feel so honored and privileged with you, Adam, to revisit those days that 
basically, you know, built the bridges and you know, mm. the building blocks in my life. And it's all a learning experience, that's for sure. <laughs> but the most scary thing was how adults decided to um, continue as business as usual. Mm. Mm. And, um, and really kind of just close off their hearts as the director said, time was money. I, I see a lot of parallels and, and I wanted to thank you. I really appreciate your willingness to delve into so honestly into your experiences and share them with me as we have for many, many years, but also with our listeners. And I think our listeners will probably be aware that there's parallels between this situation here where the director, Mark Daniels, tells you that time is money and your experience when you were going to be introduced as a Dr. Pepper girl in 1963 in Dallas, right before President Kennedy was shot. And I understand, as I know you do, that TV series are on tight schedules. You were filming, I think, seven episodes in over 10 days. But what seems to come across is that fundamental lack of consideration for the welfare of, if nothing else, a minor, a teenager whose father has just been carted away mm -hmm. in an ambulance. Yes. Um, well, before I mm. kind of delve into that, um, I do want to say on our Valentine's episode that we are focusing in on heart. And as our podcast is named, love mm. is a secret weapon. And it's not always mm. ecstasy. Sometimes mm. it's agony. And it all centers around heart issues. When the mind takes over, such as mm. business as usual, you know, that's when you see the contradictions. And being a minor was never a factor, I think, in show business. And going mm. back into our history, you know, uh, of, of the United States and maybe all over the world and still in many nations, that children are treated mm. as commodities, you know, in many cases. And that is something that our planet uh, needs to be or needs to grow into a greater consciousness to um, allow sequential development of a child to be a functional adult. And, um, and that's, you know... <laughs> That's a big challenge for having conducted, you know, civilization in, in a way that that has not been the primary concern, even though we talk about children so much mm. and their welfare, that so much of the time that the children are neglected or avoided or mistreated. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I know we've spoken about this in other episodes, this whole idea of when children are exposed to situations children and young people are exposed to situations that they should not be exposed to for whatever reason there can be a, a detrimental effect on development i know we've also spoken particularly given this podcast is a, a lot about tv and film that you did during that time about the you know the treatment of young people on sets um you know, even that, I, I know this is probably something that's used every now and then, but the fact that you get your eyes sprayed with this solution to, to start crying. And, and Mark Daniels, of course, we do have to say was a very accomplished director. He directed many iconic episodes of Star Trek, the original series. He directed on I Love Lucy, on uh, the TV series Alice later on. He, he gets credit, along with his editor, for the three-camera approach to, to filming sitcoms versus the one-camera approach. So he was, a, he was a very accomplished director, but in that moment there is just that, that real fundamental lack of, of consideration that even if the show did have to go on, could this not have been done in a different, in a different manner? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, when you were talking about a, a child actor, um, I just recall Shirley Temple, I think around the age of three or four years old, being yeah, told yeah, that her dog died, you know, <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure it's it's fairly common because it's it's I mean it's probably extraordinary if a young child can mm. call on those emotions. I mean, I I don't have a, a true example of it. Um, I just watched uh, Charles Dickens' mm. Oliver mm. Twist, and that young man 
uh, was extraordinary. He was probably 10, 12 mm. years old, something like that. Yeah. Elizabeth Taylor is another one who had a natural mm. ability, Patty Duke, and on and on. But um, it's extraordinary when a young person can call on their emotions and not really um, be manipulated into it. So um, it can be it can be damaging. Mm. It can mm. be permanently and, damaging. You know, I kind of wonder, because this was your first acting role uh, in a drama, at least. I mean, you'd done some acting in the Beach Party films, but that was that was largely limited to, to the performance and the songs. And But this was your first acting role in a drama. And it's kind of ironic uh, that you've got, you know, two people who, who were sort of the main stars of that seven episode arc who were playing very serious, but of course have gone on to become iconic comedic actors. And we're talking about Cloris Leachman, of course, and Leslie Nielsen, who played very, very straight in the 50s and 60s, but then went on to, of course, do Police Squad and The Naked Gun. You know, and, and I, <laughs> yes. um, you know, I mean, how was it to be on a set and, and particularly your first dramatic role when, you know, as you said, while you had done some acting classes previously and, and in, engaged in some lessons, but largely that wasn't a focus um, of the approach that your, your dad, Maury, took to your career. How did it feel to be on a set with quite accomplished actors or, or to, to just be on a dramatic set in general? Yeah, I think it just felt like an mm. honour to be there. And, um, and then my work ethic kicked in and you know, mm. I learned my lines, you know, I showed up on time, I stayed for as long as, you know, I had to, yeah. which are very long days mm. when you're on set. And um, I enjoyed it to a point, you know, um, I would have preferred... Uh, <laughs> it's so funny how sometimes, especially female actors are not, yeah, female mm. performers, let's say. Uh, well, let's use mm -hmm. Cher as an example. Um, you know, as a singer, she was mm. very glamorous until she got her role in Silkwood and mm. then Moonstruck, where they stripped her makeup down, gave her gray, fuzzy hair, and, you know, just like <laughs> took away all the glamour. And of course, in Moonstruck, she yeah. regained mm. it all at the end. But it's that willingness uh, of an actress to kind of be mm. uh, naked in front of the camera, mm. so to speak, <laughs> entirely, in some cases, <laughs> realistically, you know, um, if it yeah. suits the role. So that was my experience that, you know, after making up and, you know, and being on Shindig and on the Beach Party movies mm. and whatever mm. else I was doing live, you know, I always had to be makeup ready and my hair was ready and my, you know, clothing was nicely, yeah. you know, addressed. And then, you know, my character on Dr. Kildare was um, a very impoverished young mm. woman, young mother, um, who was looking very drab and very sickly and you know, had had yeah. nothing glamorous <laughs> to wear, you know, had literally they mm. they dulled me down uh, by my complexion and they pulled my hair back so it was an entirely different image and that's a little uncomfortable that was that was a bit uncomfortable even though when the cameras roll and the and the director says you know mm. <laughs> go you know um then then the uh dialogue kind of transforms you and you forget about the self-conscious mm. at least that's what happened to me i forgot about myself consciousness of not really fitting the identity that I had yeah that's actually before. really interesting I hadn't thought about it that way that you know as you say as you get into the role as you get into the character it makes sense in terms of the way she's dressed and the way she looks but to go from and you know whether it was you or whether it's other sort of young females that idea that often the image was was all about to be looked at or photo ready and picture perfect to have a role where it's the complete opposite of that. Um, yeah, it must have been a very new thing. I, mm -hmm. I do want to say um, for our, our listeners that the Dr. Kildare episodes that Donna was on are now on DVD. So you can see those uh, really excellent episodes because that um, show, of course, was very contemporary in its approach in terms of the issue of the dialysis machines, who, which had only 
I guess, recently been developed in, in the, you know, the 20 or so years previous to those episodes. Um, you know, they always went for very contemporary and often quite um, controversial issues on that, on that series. But um, there is one, I know there's one picture, and I guess this must have been taken by the NBC photographer, perhaps, given Maury was not on set for much of it. But there's a picture which is a lot more glam. So Anna does glam up eventually, <laughs> at least in a picture where there's a wonderful picture of yourself and Richard Chamberlain um, that you have in your collection yes and that was okay, definitely right, was. taken by my dad before yeah bef- before he had his mm. um, collapse and um and yes i did do some research mm-hmm. on youtube where it is available there for instance there's a incredible scene with robert redford on dr kildare with richard chamberlain oh, and wow. they get into a fight Physically, they roll <laughs> around, you know, <laughs> and that's that's pretty amazing to see Robert Redford, yeah. you know, in the early days because I had the experience with Robert yes. Redford when I was much younger, Absolutely. you know, on Playhouse ninety. So, but mm, he was still mm. doing TV at the time, and uh, and there he is in a t-shirt and um, and kind of slumped. I could see mm. a little tummy <laughs> there, and you know. And and Richard Chamberlain is his physique is so trim and fit and you know his <laughs> posture is so perfect that you put the two of them together and I was going to say it's really quite a spectacle. So that's available on on YouTube and there's other clips, yeah. not full episodes, but there's clips on YouTube if you don't and want to invest in a, in and a CD. Yeah, set. just thinking of, of uh, Richard Chamberlain and uh, and Robert Redford. That's uh, yeah. Mm interesting that's all I can say about that but but um yeah and of course you did have when you were much younger in in I think it was 1960 or thereabouts when you had a small role in Playhouse 90 about a um uh, about the Warsaw ghetto uh, where Robert Redford plays a, a, a young German sergeant in that um you know a very impactful piece of tv but um you know, it must have been, uh, you know, albeit before what had happened on the set with Maury, you know, to be on the MGM lot, That's to be right. running around a little bit with, with your friend Janice and to be able to, you know, spy David McCallum or, you know, be around the Dr. Kildare set with her. That must have been a kind of fun experience, at, 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 partic- at least for her. It was fun for me too, you know, just to go with her and kind of feel that wild, abandoned, you know, just kind of the pressures off. And um, a moment just to to be a young <laughs> woman, you know, with my with my girlfriend, and um, and and I I never expressed this other thing that I saw, mm, which mm. is pretty interesting, I think. Well, this was a day that I wasn't with Janice, but um, I mean that was a special time. Just the fact that that she. I guess her mother dropped her off and, you know, for mm. a while so she could have lunch with me. <laughs> Don't know how that happened because yeah. she probably had yep. to skip school for, a, you know, for for that experience, which I'm sure her mom was like, okay, this is really special. But um, on another day that uh, I was on the MGM lot, I was walking along and um, there was mm-hmm. a bar yeah. on the lot. And I walked by, you know, in the sunshine and looked in a dark, Mm. dark doorway. And down at the end, there was a stream of sunlight going in so I could see. And there was little Marvin hunched hunched over on a bar stool on the bar. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And and he was filming Cat Baloo. And the other thing, you know, the other... um, as I'm looking into the bar and seeing mm, mm. Lee Marvin, I was reminded that the young man who was playing my husband. That's right. Coincidentally had a role in Cat Blue in which I believe he was either nominated for an That's award right. for his I think role it was Tom, in that. To, yeah, Tom um, Nardini. I Tom. think he was nominated for a Golden Globe for mm-hmm. his role in Cat Blue. Yeah. I was like, wow, that was interesting because it kind of coincided as he's working on the MGM lot with me. He's also, you know, working yeah. on another project. Yeah, absolutely. Because that would have been, yeah, lot. absolutely at the right time. They were both 1965. Yeah, that's re- that's really cool that they just came to you just then. Yeah. And, oh, and I do remember walking into the yes. Irving Thalberg building 
So I had the, this occasion to be in this incredibly historic building, the Irving, Irving Thalberg building. Mm-hmm. And in, you know, in the reception area, are, the walls are lined with extra large headshots of portraits of, you know, Judy Garland. And in my memory, it was Catherine Hepburn. And yeah. Could have even been a, a young Elizabeth Taylor and uh, maybe even a Mickey Rooney, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and that was amazing to see the size of these portraits. I mean, normally we see a portrait and should be eight by 10 or something yeah, like that. Yeah. These were huge, bigger than posters. <laughs> and and they're all framed and lined on the walls like trophies. So that, yeah, was, the, that uh, was an incredible. Yeah, I was just going to say the uh, the the kind of legends of MGM during the 30s and 40s. Yeah, not not eight by tens that you're going to be able to put under your arm and walk out with very easily. No, not at all. <laughs> you know, I kind of want to want to bring us back a little bit to this idea of you, you said something very interesting. I think at the end of the reading about the the kind of physical manifestations of of holding something in or keep you know holding on to a line in this case you're, you're talking about the idea that Maury was actually your adopted father and, and not your father and, and and as our listeners know you didn't find that out to many many years later but um you know I was interested in what you had to say about those physical effects of lying and I did some reading on this issue and it's a really complex one I was reading some work by a uh, doctor at the University of Rochester Benjamin Chapman and his colleagues and they looked at this a few years ago and they didn't look at lying per se but they looked at this idea of a emotional suppression so when we suppress the experience or the expression of our emotions basically keeping our emotions to our ourselves and they looked at health risk and they found that there was an elevated risk for uh, mortality as well as illnesses such as cancer and cardiovascular disease and those who are higher on the tendency to engage in this type of emotional suppression now these authors are not suggesting that simply suppressing or lying leads to disease or or that kind of hypothesis but they delve into some of the ways in which lying or emotional suppression in their case can be detrimental to our health and they focus on three issues and um you know the first is this idea of the physiological effects of suppression or what we're talking about in in lying and we we know for example uh, that lying is associated with greater effects in the limbic system and the limbic system is tied into that fight or flight response that threat system so when we're under threat that that system kicks in to basically you know is adaptive to take care of us to make sure that we're ready to fight or to to flee but what we know is that when people have that heightened uh, system over time if they're perhaps in um you know a series of stressful circumstances or chaos or or things like that, that system can kind of be elevated for a long period of time. And there's a range of negative health effects as a result of kind of always being on that threat system. So, um, you know, there's that suggestion from their work and the work of other people that, you know, suppression of emotion or withholding the truth or so on can have these effects on our the systems that are there to help us. But if over elevated can lead to quite negative effects because those stress hormones are, are constantly elevated. They also speak about this idea that Perhaps what could also be involved is that when people are suppressing their emotions, or in this case, holding on to lies, they don't tend to share that with people. And that whole catharsis we get from sharing a situation that we're having problems with doesn't happen when you're holding on to emotion and suppressing it and not willing to share it. So you don't get that kind of interpersonal support or social support that you can get from other people. Then they also talk about the idea that there can be behavioural effects, that when we suppress something in one area of our lives, it comes out in other ways, whether we, we drink more, we engage in too much eating, we, we engage in risk behaviours. And so I was just sort of interested in in your perspective on what not not only I guess for your parents but you but yourself in terms of the physical or, or psychological or the outcomes that you feel there were from that lie being hidden for so long yeah that's that's a deep deep issue um the first image that comes up is like being in darkness you can't mm. find your way yeah. and I think I might have brought this up previously but our foundation, you know, mm. as, a, as a human being, when we're born and as we're developing, you know, that we're developing our foundation. Mm. And um, if you're functioning in, in my case, a lie, yeah. first of all, trust is non-existent. And, mm. you know, mm. I personally couldn't trust my parents and therefore 
you know, living in that kind of an environment taught me to mistrust myself. Yeah. And what I realize is what you were saying about fight or flight mm. is that when the brain is always functioning on survival, you know, mm. your adrenaline is working overtime and, yeah. you know, the physically the, adre- the adrenal glands are dictating your emotions and they sit right on top of your kidneys, which mm. create your antibodies so that you're, you know, you can have a strong immune system and uh, <laughs> infiltration system for yeah. your entire <laughs> body and, and for your lungs. And, and it's also associated with your eyes. And, you know, let's just say metaphorically, you'd like to see clearly so that you can have truth as your foundation to be able to develop who you are be Mm. being in a trusting environment with um people that you can trust um so no accident Mm. that that my adopted dad who you know he was he was kind of a you know in his time he was a quiet man he never shared Mm. with me um, mm. I don't think he had the the liberty to share it yeah. much with me, and mm. um, and that fits into your you know idea of suppression. Mm. I mean, he couldn't he couldn't talk because he maybe the lie was too hard for him to deal with, and and he couldn't say the truth, so he couldn't say anything. Yeah, and you know except dictate a lot to me, you know, in how I'm supposed to behave, and um, caused you know caused a, a restriction in me. And more of that control factor that, again, as a kid, you know, you have an imagination. If you're creative, you, you know, and so many of us are, but you don't want that suppressed. So you, mm-hmm. you can discover who you are and, you know, and, and have, have a productive life mm. um, and balanced. Um, so what I'm saying, okay, so he, he ended up dying of a brain tumor. Yeah, yeah. And he lived a long life, but, um, you know, those things, maybe it didn't come from the lie, but I think starting with his stomach erupting and mm. um, and literally he'd walk around whenever I saw him as a young adult, myself mm. as a young adult, he'd always walk around um, holding his, his chest and holding, you know, kind of like holding his heart. And I didn't know if it was... Uh, you know, I didn't know what that gesture was, but yeah, something yeah. was going on. And then, mm. you know, ultimately he died of a, a brain tumor. Mm. So um, I just, I just know that lies are dark and, you know, the truth is, you know, something, an energy in the light and, mm. and mm. that gives you clarity and, um, and a strong foundation. Yeah. And I think this whole chaos, you know, as I think people often find that when there's some of those chaos in one's own, uh, you know, personal life, as as there was generally in a lot of the stuff that you speak about, but also particularly on this set in this particular week, sometimes it is to be mirrored in the outside world. And of course, as you said, as you were filming Dr. Kildare, what was happening were the Watts riots. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, yeah. unbelievable after that whole day of tragedy and mm. another layer of tragedy piled on top. Absolutely. And it was for, you know, for those of our listeners who, who might not be aware of the riots, it, they, they, they started off because there was a confrontation between the police and a young uh, 21-year-old African-American man. But then, of course, it it went into more as, um, you know, it, it kind of tapped into, I guess, the, the whole idea of, you know, discrimination and, and uh, lesser opportunity and employment and housing and schooling inequalities. And so, you know, that, that one sort of situation uh, escalated to, I think it was where there was something like, I think it was 14,000 people from the Californian Army National Guard brought in and there were, there were I think, 34 deaths and it, and it went on for, you know, it, it would have probably been the, the worst riots um, in that area until the, the Rodney King ones, you know, many mm. years later. So, mm. so what an experience to sort of, you know, walk out of a set after a long day and to, to, to essentially see the hills ablaze. It's pretty much a war zone. You know, yeah. that particular day um, is definitely emblazoned in my my memory. And yet 
here we are. You know, mm. Mm. it's it, it's been proven to reiterate, you know, our politics that we just lived through in this country and in many other countries with um, very dysfunctional leadership that mm. um, that incessantly lie. Yeah, um, you know, that's such a big issue and, and maybe something for a subsequent time, but that idea that we've, you know, we're, we've kind of almost, yeah, been, been fed this idea that we can lie or we can have these alternative facts I you know I don't even want to mention that because it's just ridiculous but um yeah I, again we see and I know we spoke in in I think our first episode about this whole idea of even the you know the the relationship um you know the inequalities and the and even relationships with police and and so it's a big issue um but it's certainly one that I think as you've said at the beginning of the podcast how what happened in the 60s um the good and the bad you know it is still being felt now as um, as we we enter this this new age um, mm-hmm. in the world and yeah mm-hmm. yes we need a lot of healing and we need a lot of love and to reiterate you know love is my favorite four letter word <laughs> and I know I'm not the only one I probably can echo your feelings about the same. Um, mm. love is truly, truly <laughs> a secret weapon. Absolutely. And we've, uh, you know, a- as we end, um, you know, as always, I'd like to remind our listeners to please subscribe to our podcast on your favourite platform. Please do leave us a review because then other people can find us as well. We do always welcome comments or questions from our listeners and you can uh, do that by emailing podcast at net. Um, but given that this is a Valentine's episode, tell me a little bit about your Valentine, Donna. Of course, I know your Valentine quite well. But what I realised in our last episode is that you spoke about going to the, the prom um, with, uh, with a young man, but we didn't really follow up. So, so your high school prom, you went with a young man named Jerry. And some of our listeners might know, but who did Jerry ultimately become? <laughs> yes, well, it took took over three decades for me to mm. wake up but apparently <laughs> our prom date was very significant to him and he went on to have several relationships and marriage and children mm-hmm. um, but ultimately in the mid 90s uh, we reestablished our friendship and uh because we had family members uh we Mm. had seen each other you know kind of intermittently through the years but Mm. uh, this time it was very different and we fell in love and now we're married and we're Mm. about to celebrate 26 years amazing and i have to say that of of the first what Two thirds of my life, <laughs> um, living in uh, kind of the uh, hmm, shadow, mm. and and mm. uh, as we spoke, you know, in this survival mode, mm. uh, overcoming obstacles all the time, and mm. yet, you know, some part of who you really are, who I really was, you know, came through. Um, but that really started changing when my relationship with Jared uh, was established in 1995. And it was Mm. actually March 2nd was the date that we rendezvoused. And then March 7th was my 48th birthday. Mm. And, Mm. um, and we've been together ever since. And it's, um, it's been, it's been such a dramatic change for me to be in an environment with someone who trusts me who I trust, and uh, it's it's the total antithesis of the way I was raised and then continued, you know, unfortunately to just uh, repeat patterns that came from a dysfunctional childhood. Mm. And that was more subtle, as we said in one of our episodes, deep, deep instilling of shame, shame, Mm. which is such a dark energy. And, yeah. um, and, and may I say that 
I'm discovering that those kinds of energies that are um, are imposed on us by others uh, leave an imprint. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. They leave. They leave an imprint. But that's not who you are. And if one has the courage and the um, tenacity and the persistence and the physical endurance mm. to really commit to n- releasing that imprint that's not you you know mm. uh then the energies or behaviors that were imposed on you um let your own love and your own light shine through um <laughs> leaving a path of uh you know some mm, very uncomfortable situations uh, and it, it's worth every every bit of that energy to gain that awareness and um and stop you know stop for a moment which this coronavirus again in it, in its own way has slowed us down it has to help us reevaluate and yes there it's done a lot of damage along the way mm. Mm. but in my own personal experience there's definitely hurdles but awarenesses that have come that have been the most valuable lessons in my life. And part of it is because of our podcast and our listeners and uh, the ability to discuss these things and be open Mm. and completely unbridled in discussing them. Yeah. I, I, I have nothing to add. I'm just privileged to to be able to engage in this podcast with you and to share these experiences with you um, and with our listeners. And so I've been Dr. Adam Drachi. I'm not uh, as good as Dr. Kildare or Dr. Richard Chamberlain, I would argue, but hopefully I've been okay. Um, and thanks again, Donna, for sharing your experiences with us. I say ta-da to you, Adam. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> and... Um, you <laughs> you are your own star and <laughs> and and I welcome our listeners to a wonderful interview of Richard Chamberlain when he was 81 years old speaking with one of your premier Australian commentators telling his life story his story of you know coming out at at a much later time mm. in his life living in secrecy pretending to be someone that he wasn't for way too long. Um, I parallel so much of his life experience in my own way. And I say to my listeners, our listeners, that I hope you enjoy this marvelous interview with Richard Chamberlain. It's never too late and happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's. Do you have a picture in the attic? You look extraordinary. You look fantastic. I do look reasonably good for 81. (laughs) I know that, but I certainly don't look like I used to. (laughs) If you want to, you'll regain the use of your legs. Good memories of those times? Oh, yeah. Suddenly I was famous and all that stuff. Richard was determined not to be typecast when Kildare ended. Dr. Kildare was five years in American living rooms. In fact, living rooms all over the world. It has a huge gravity Mm. when you're a character that people have invited into their homes for so long. So it takes a lot of energy to get out of that typecasting, which is one of the reasons I went to live in England shortly after the Kildare days. So that broke the mold, which is very, again, very lucky. Hadley, the more you talk, the less I like you. The only real problem here is that girl's going to die of laryngeal edema unless we do something to save her. Yeah, well, good luck, Doc. Just count me out. But the impossibly handsome actor was hiding a secret, one that he spent decades hiding from his fans, even his parents. When you grow up being a kind of person that is generally despised, you take that in and you begin to, on some level, to despise yourself. It just happens. And in 2003, he made a startling confession that made headlines around the world. Being gay in this business was not welcome at all, especially for a romantic leading man. And so I was very careful to walk that line of, uh, of unknownness. <laughs> Did you have to keep it a secret? Oh, absolutely. 
And when did you feel you no longer did have to keep When I was 68. 68. <laughs> And was that a good feeling when you were finally able to? Well, be the, open the up? goodness, the good, the great part of the, of what happened. I was writing a book. I remember a, a particular experience. I was writing in a little tiny room in Hawaii, and it was as if there was not an angel there, but it was as if an angel came into the room and said, "Richard, that's all over," because. It's, a, it's just, a, being gay is just a, a benign fact, meaning almost nothing. Because you say you're straight, well, what does that tell you about a person? Does it tell you they're smart, dumb, good, kind, uh, hardworking, lazy? That tells you almost nothing. The same with the word gay. It tells you almost nothing about a person. I was suddenly b bone deep, soul deep, freed, of that self-dislike that had weighed so heavily through my life. And it was, that part was just amazing. And then I was suddenly on, on book tours, yep. on all the talk shows, the important ones, big ones, and all they wanted to talk about was being gay in Hollywood, and I was fine with that. The fear was just gone, gone. which was an, an amazing experience. Yes, love.